So um, today I'll be giving you um, a little summary of what I did when I was in the UK working in Giovanna Milucci's lab, looking at the unfolded protein response in neurodegeneration in mice. So there's um, in neurodegenerative diseases like CJD, um, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and ALS, you have common things that are happening. So there, um, one, of the, one of the symptoms that you'll see or things that you'll see in the brain is aggregation of misfolded proteins. Again, you can see here depicted is just a brain from a prion diseased mouse with accumulation of um, deposits. You can see in the brown staining. And these are misfolded um, proteins. And in any disease, like in Alzheimer's disease, you might see plaques and Parkinson's disease, alpha-synuclein um, deposits. So these are very common things in neurodegeneration. Another um, thing that is seen in neurodegenerative diseases is inflammation of glial cells. What glial cells are are the supporter cells of the neurons. And here um, you can see the, the brown staining is just the, um, the inflammation of these supporter cells. Also, um, another thing that's found early in disease is synaptic dysfunction and loss, which you can see in the, in the picture that basically neurons um, communicate within, with each other through either a pre, presynaptic neuron to a postsynaptic neuron, and this causes chemical um, communication, but this is also loss in um, neurodegenerative diseases like CJD. And then, um, so this is depicted in this. And then finally, you have irreversible neuronal loss. So these three things are happening prior, prior to neuronal loss. So um, as you can see here, it's just neuronal loss being pictured. So here's an early prion um, mouse brain, and you can see the, the purple punctate or neuronal cell bodies, and this is loss in, neuro, in um, prion diseased mice. So with all these things that are happening in, all, in prion disease as well as other neurodegenerative diseases, we had this question of are there common pathways in disease? And so, um, so on the next slide, I'll show you that we basically, our first thing we wanted to do was to take our mouse model of prion disease. So basically, we infect these mice, and then within 12 weeks post-infection, they succumb to prion disease. So one of the first things that I did was we wanted to map out, well, what's happening in these, in these diseased mice. And like others, we found that the earliest um, indicator of disease was synapse, synaptic loss, followed by memory loss, and then this catastrophic fall in global protein synthesis, which is basically meaning that proteins were not being made in the brain. And then this was preceded by neuronal loss. And the types of proteins that we, um, we found to be so critical were both the presynaptic and the postsynaptic proteins. So these are the proteins that are allowing the synapse to function properly, which then will allow the neurons to function properly. So these synaptic proteins were, were, fo were found to be um, low at this nine-week time point, um, so nine weeks post-infection in these brains. So um, we found that this was a critical time point in disease. So then um, one of the first things, so, so we know that we have this loss of protein, so we wanted to see, well, what is driving this? So. Um, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> so what is causing these proteins to not be made? So the, the, um, the, cellular, pro the cell cellular processes to control proteins being made um, are kind of like a quality control system. So they, um, I'm sorry, I have a lot of animations. So the protein synthesis control pathways, one of the key ones that we looked at was the unfolded protein response. And so the unfolded protein response, you can go ahead and click, um, and then again, is um, allows proteins to fold and function properly. So the cell wants this pathway to be turned on and activated whenever there's a cellular stress so that you can um, regulate bad proteins from being made and not being made. But, um, and one of the cellular stresses that it can, can happen is a misfolded protein. So from um, when PRPC is misfolded to PRPSC, 
possibly this is what was happening. And so on my next slide, I'll show you that, um, sorry, he's talking. <laughs> So, so how this pathways works, so the unfolded protein response has multiple steps in it. And basically what's happening is that a key protein called EIF2-alpha is phosphorylated. And this phosphorylation it causes activation of this pathway. This is, um, causes reductions in proteins being made. And so what we found was that when we had a rise of the misfolded protein PRPSC at the same time that we had that nine week time point, we also had loss of synaptic proteins and activation of this pathway looking at EF2-alpha. And then, so this, we had this reduction in proteins being made followed by synaptic failure and neurodegeneration. So what we wanted to do was see if we could um, modulate this pathway by using um, lentiviruses. And lentiviruses are just a laboratory tool to be able to manipulate a pathway or genes. So, um, what we did was we targeted GAD34, which is the cellular's endogenous way of dephosphorylating EF2-alpha. So this, if you, if you add in GAD34 into cells, then it won't allow, it will dephosphorylate and not have activation of this pathway. So, um, and then, so what we did is we added in GAD34, as well as took out PRP. So we knocked down the, PR, the prion protein. And then we also did another um, paradigm where we actually added a compound that allows EF2-alpha to be phosphorylated and activated, and this um, would, would what we would expect to accelerate the disease. Okay, the next slide. So the way that we set up this experiment was we would inoculate um, mice with prion, and then five weeks later we would do stereotaxic um, brain injections directly into a part of the brain called the hippocampus, and um, we would um, deliver our lentivirus. And so we had multiple um, treatment groups. So we had mice that just received control. We had prion-only mice, then prion um, plus salubrinol. Again, this is the compound that um, causes activation of EF2-alpha. LV controls, which is just our control, and then PRP knockdown as well as GAD34 expression. And we tested, so what we did was we treated these mice, and then we looked at them at that nine week time point when synaptic proteins were down and um, um, prior to neuronal loss. Thank you. Much better. Okay, cool, thank you. Okay, much better. Okay, so, um, so, so we then would test these mice at that nine week post-infection time point. So um, just in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of bullet point what we had found. So basically, when we removed EF2-alpha phosphorylation, either through targeting GAD34 or by removing the prion protein, we, what we saw was that we could restore protein synthesis. So the amount of protein, of synaptic proteins, the good proteins for the neurons, um, we were able to restore this as well as synaptic transmission, which basically means, again, that pre and that postsynaptic could could speak to each other, um, behavioral deficits in the mice, as well as um, just synapse number in general. So we then wanted to see, well, what was happening at um, 12 weeks post-infection. So this is the time point where prion, mice that were not treated with a Lindy virus would succumb to the disease. And um, what we found that, so again, um, these are the prion sick mice. Um, and like I showed before, those purple nuclear staining is what the neuronal cellular bodies. And you can see that that's lost in the prion sick, the salubrinol, which again is phosphorylating EF2-alpha, the control lentivirus mice. But in PRP knockdown, as well as GAD34 expression, the neurons seem to be um, prevented um, from, from death in um, this paradigm. And then um, this is just a graphical depiction of that when you count the neurons in this area of the brain. And then we also looked at survival of these mice. So again, most of them, um, prion-only mice, um, succumbed to the disease about 87 days in. But we did have, um, although small, it was significant elongation of the disease, um, of the mice, I'm sorry, life, um, when we expressed GAD34 or, of course, knockdown PRP, which was shown before. 
So, so these experiments in this study was great for, for identifying a mechanism or a pathway that we could target in, um, in prion-diseased mice and possibly other diseases. But the, the caveat to all this was we were targeting a very, very small part of the brain. So just a um, very small part of the hippocampus. So we wanted to see, well, was there something out there that we could use to target this pathway that would be more um, bioavailable to the rest of the brain? And GSK, GSK had this compound um, that actually inhibits PERC phosphorylation. And the way, I, didn't, I know I didn't explain this earlier, but basically in order to get EIF2-alpha to be phosphorylated or activated, you must have PERC be phosphorylated. And so basically this inhibitor, GSK2606414, which I'll just call it 414 from now on, um, inhibits PERC. And so what's great about this compound is this bio, it's orally bioavailability. Bio so basically, we could treat the mice orally, and it would get into their brain. So, and not only just the small hippocampus, but the whole brain. So this was very exciting to try. And so just to kind of give you a little bit of the experimental setup. So um, like I said earlier, we, oops, sorry. We knew, um, we knew the disease course or the time course in these prion-diseased mice. So we knew we wanted to target an early um, time point with this drug as well as a late time point or a mid to late time point. So we used, um, so basically we started treating these prion diseased mice at seven weeks post-infection and we carried on to treat them until they were 12 weeks post-infected. Then we also treated them at this nine week post-infection time point. So this was the point where synaptic proteins dropped and um, carried on to treat them until 12 weeks post-infection. And then um, we took, we took, um, took these, these mice and autopsied them and then looked at their brains at this 12-week post-infection. But before we did that, the first thing we did was look at behavioral um, changes in these mice. And so um, one of the readouts that we could use for this was novel object recognition. And how this works, it's a memory test for mice. And basically, the mice are shown two objects. And then two hours later, we take away w one of the objects and give them a new one. So mice inherently want to explore the new object. So, um, but when, you ha when they have prion disease, specifically starting at that eight week to nine week time point, this is lost. So the mice basically are shown the new object and they don't know that they have seen the old object, so they just explore everything. So um, they basically have a deficit in that behavior. But what was great was that in the mice that we treated early, so at that seven week time point on, we were able to prevent this memory loss from happening. But we were not um, able to prevent the memory loss in the older mice that we started at the nine week infection. We then looked at another behavioral um, t um, test that's used in prion disease. So basically it's called burrowing and you get a tube and you fill it up with food pellets and you leave it with the mouse for um, two hours to overnight, and they love it. They'll burrow out all the little food and um, have a good old time with the, with the, in the tube and everything. But when prion disease sets in at that nine week time point, they don't do this. And so we were able to, but the good thing was we were able to prevent this in both that early time point and that late time point. So the mice still were able to burrow at that, um, within 12 weeks of or 10 weeks post-infection. We then, um, the next thing we wanted to look at was clinical signs or clinical disease in these mice. So a prion mouse will have, um, early on, they'll get a rigid tail, stop grooming as well. And then later on, they'll start to lose their limb function. And so this is a mouse, again, at that 12-week um, post-infection time point um, that is um, prion sick. So he's got a rigid tail, his limbs, are basically not working and he's not well groomed. But with the treatment of um, at that early time point as well as the late time point, these mice look, look normal when you, when you look at them. And then we also, another readout is clasping. And so um, a, a prion infected mouse um, at that 12 week time point will clasp, although the mice that were per, um, treated, this was prevented. So this was really, really promising as well. 
We then wanted to look at um, neuro the overall brain protection. So like I said earlier, the um, prior study, we were just targeting a small part of the brain, but this way we were able to, this co with this compound, we were able to target the whole brain. And in the interest of time, I'm just showing you a few of these sections. Basically, this is from um, a prion diseased um, mouse, and you can see that that neuronal ribbon or those cellular bodies are gone, as well as you get that spongiform change um, in, in the brain, in the cortex, as well as all over the brain. But this seemed to be prevented in both the early and the late stage. In the early stage, you get beautiful neuroprotection um, and um, beautiful protection of even sponge for change when the mice were treated pretty early at that seven week time point. At the late time point, you do protect the neurons, but you do still see some spongiforms change. So something, it's almost like it got frozen at that nine week time point. And then um, I'm almost done. So basically the biochemically we then looked and we saw that we got, um, with this treatment, we rescued those synaptic proteins that were key to keeping the neurons alive. And um, interestingly, we also saw that um, PRP levels, both PRPC and SC didn't change. So that's, that, that was interesting and something we're exploring a lot more. Um, although this compound seemed to be good and it, targeting the pathway was very good, it was toxic. So these um, mice lost about 20% of their body weight. They were slightly, slightly hyperglycemic and they had pancreatic toxicity. And you can see here, I mean, really the only thing you need to notice is that there's a lot more tissue in this image versus this image. And basically they lose about 50% of their pancreas. And because of this, this the mice would have to be sacrificed so the, the studies would have to end. So basically in summary, we know that EF2 alpha phosphorylation seems to be important in prion disease and that we can target it in multiple ways to get neuroprotection in these mice. So my conclusions were that, or our conclusions, that we can target this genetically and pharmacologically and that this is, seems to be independent of PRP. Um, we definitely need, need to find a better compound, maybe a compound that, um, that, that targets this pathway but n is not toxic. And then what's interesting about this is that this seems to be a generic cellular pathway. So in other um, neurodegenerative diseases, you'll see activation of this pathway in patients. And recently a paper used that same GSK414 in um, flies with ALS and they were protected as well. So there is some promising um, effects out there of targeting the unfolded protein response. And I'd just like to acknowledge, of course, Giovanna Malucci and um, the rest of the group. And then now I'm at the Prion Research Center at Colorado State University working with Dr. Glenn Telling, who's gracefully let me continue look, looking at prion disease. So thank you.